All right, welcome back, everybody. How was lunch? Yay! <laughs> uh, before we get underway, um, I just want to remind you about the Lightning Talk submissions. So, Lightning Talks are tomorrow afternoon, and both sub and we're accepting submissions both from people at the conference who want to speak live, and um, online people who are watching and want to uh, phone in their talk. So, um, there's a form that you can reach by going to the schedule, going to the Lightning Talk slot, clicking on the details there, you'll see all the instructions about what a Lightning Talk uh, should or shouldn't be about. You'll see um, what you get in return. If you give us a Lightning Talk, uh, we will give you a PDF from, a packed publishing, from the Pact Publishing Library. There are 20 books in there, quite a few machine learning ones, actually, which might be of interest to the people in this talk. Um, have a look at those and submit a Lightning Talk, and we would love to hear what you want to talk about tomorrow. Um, great, moving right along. Uh, we have Tristan and Taylor from Massey University, and they're going to be talking to us about generative art in Python, and I can't wait to see it. Uh, please make them feel welcome. Cool. Hi, welcome to the talk. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so we're talking about generative art with Python, and we're going to be looking at two different tools here, specifically something called Pi5 and something called BPy, which we'll discuss in some detail as we move on. But I thought a good place to start um, is, first of all, I'm a lecturer at Massey University, specifically in creative technologies. So I've been using Python in industry, but also for my teaching. Uh, Taylor does visual effects, and there are many areas in visual effects where Python is used as well. Um, so I thought I'd start with an introduction just to generative art, uh, because some of you may or may not be new to it. And uh, there are a lot of definitions out there, but the one I kind of like the most is this one, because it's one of the more concise things. Um, but I could take that a step further, and if I really want to put in a nutshell what this generative art thing is about, it's about making something that makes something, right? So instead of creating a Jackson, Pollo Jackson Pollock artwork, why don't you just create Jackson Pollock? and then he can randomly make lots of paintings and you can pick the ones you kind of like. So what we'll be talking about over here is how to use Python as a tool to create something that creates creative output. So there are many areas that this overlaps and those are just some of them um, because generative art is actually a pretty broad kind of field. And I'd also add to that that there is also the application side of it. So you might be using these techniques over here for generating characters, for narratives, uh, for let's just say gaming environments, architectural geometry, uh, poetry, the list is pretty endless. So I'm going to give you a very quick history of this generative art thing, but that would actually take kind of hours worth of lectures. So I'm going to take this from my point of view. So this is not the authoritative history of generative art. This is just the history of my experiences with generative art. And if I think back as early as I can, my experience, and I didn't know about this yet, started with um, quite simply piracy. So um, I owned an XT computer. That was the first one I owned. And uh, of course, we traded a lot of games and things on floppy disks like this. Now, game developers weren't happy about this, of course, because it, 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 of course, incurs loss in terms of, of, of the business that they're trying to make. So um, there was all sorts of creative and elaborate ways of coming up with copy protection. And one of those, as you can see over here, is for the game Stunts. Uh, stunt driving game, and what would happen is you'd have to have the manual that came in the box, because games used to come in a box, right? And it would ask you when you start the game to type in a certain word on a certain page. If you didn't have the manual, of course, you didn't know what it was, and the game just kind of crashed. Um, of course, people started using photocopiers to photocopy the manuals, so these developers got more creative. They said, okay, you want to photocopy our manual? We'll make this tiny little alone in the dark manual over here, and if you really want to pull apart a hundred little pages and photocopy them all, fine, go for it. Or if you look on the other side over there, you've got dial -a pirate which was for Monkey Island, which is just had a new recent fact. And it was a, a thing of wheels where you'd have to kind of turn the wheels in response to a question on the screen. But, you know, obviously, if you really wanted to, you could still disassemble these things and photocopy them. So SimCity 1 actually had this um, sheet that had red uh, with black ink on it. And at the time, if you try to put that through the average photocopier, the whole thing just came out black. Of course, the easiest way to get around the stuff, or let's just say the most convenient way, would be to write some kind of a crack for the game. And people started doing this, and when they did, they obviously wanted to have some credit for their work. So when you would start a crack game, you'd get a little message, something like this. And the thing is, over time, these uh, crack intros, as they were called, became more and more elaborate, uh, and more and more elaborate still. And 
they became so elaborate and, became, and people became so competitive about what they were trying to sort of show off in terms of how good they were programming all these sorts of multimedia tricks that this spawned a whole other scene called the demo scene. And the demo scene was basically crack intros except without even having to crack any software. So you would do the most elite, there were all sorts of sort of terms that went with this, and it is, it is still going, by the way, really in Northern Europe, um, all sorts of really impressive programming trickery to get as much performance out of some pretty limited hardware in those days. It, it was very much kind of Amiga-oriented, and I always wanted an Amiga, but it was too expensive. But then as the years kind of went on, it got to the 90s, um, the more and more PC stuff. Um, anyway, talking about the 90s, uh, I used to get these things called disk mags, which would be huge collections of these demo scene demos. Um, and sometimes I would download them across BBS. Um, but of course, during the 90s, disk mags and BBS gave away to dial-up and PlayStation 1. Uh, and I kind of lost interest in it. And I think the scene died out a bit as well. And I left high school to go to college. So the second sort of half is kind of my college experience and beyond. And uh, in college, I was introduced to Macromedia Flash, which had this ActionScript programming language. And I got a lot of kicks out of this. And there was also kind of this similar C burn jinning, like very similar stuff to what you might have seen in the demo scene. So websites like Levitated had huge collections of all these impressive little demos. Um, and a, sort of a, a couple of years into, into working, I picked up my first lecturing gig. And I was looking for tools to teach creative people, visual people, how to program. And, and of course, teaching creative people to program by making art is a, is a really nice fit. It's visual, and it's what they want to do. Um, but Flash had its, you know, had its issues. It was proprietary, it was expensive, and, and a couple of other things. So um, at that time, I settled on something called processing. I don't know if anyone's heard of processing. Uh, so it's been around for about 20 years now. Uh, really neat, uh, totally targeted initially for people working with new media art and electronic arts and teaching creative people to code. It looks something like this. You have a little IDE. You write your Java code in there. Of course, Java interprets that, and what comes out is some kind of a graphic. Now, there's a library in there that enables you to write all sorts of commands like circle and fill and square, so you can draw all sorts of visual things. And around this was a big community developing who were doing some really impressive generative art. And at this time, I actually kind of looked back in history, and I found that people have been doing generative art for a lot longer than I realized. Uh, so back in the 60s, people like Vera Malma and uh, Frieda Naik were doing uh, generative art uh, using plotters, uh, pen plotters. Uh, basically, early form of printer where you have a two-axis um, pen plotting machine. You put a pen in there. It draws things, and it could do far more elaborate things than primitive screens of this time. Um, anyway, long story short, I actually settled on this piece of software, which is called Shubot, um, because it did everything that kind of processing did, but it did with Python. And interesting, this was the same time I actually encountered Python, and I looked at it. And after a very little time, I, I knew this was exactly the language I wanted to teach instead of processing Java. So what happened is uh, I went back into industry. I worked in a tech startup. I did a couple of different lecturing gigs. And I came back to uh, Mass University to start lecturing again. And I looked around for similar tools to start teaching. But by this time, processing had something called Python mode, which basically uses something called Jython to take like code that's written in Python syntax and kind of convert it to Java, I won't go into the specifics, and then your graphic comes out. And this was great because you could do everything processing, but of course using Python. Um, so just to give you an idea, if you look on the left-hand side over there, you've got the Java syntax, the setup function runs once at the beginning, the draw function runs every single frame, and all that's happening over here is I'm spawning a 400 by 400 pixel um, little display window, and I'm drawing a square in the same position every single frame. And of course, you're all familiar with Python, so what you have there on the right-hand side is pretty much exactly the same thing using Python syntax. So I thought this was great, and I ran all my courses on this. You'll notice, sorry, that the square is not drawn in the same position every time. It's actually advancing uh, as per the frame count value, so it is moving across the screen. Uh, it's leaving a trail because unless you draw a background, processing shows you everything before. Sorry. Um, Jython has limitations, though. It's not C Python, of course. It only supports Python 2.7. That became more of a problem recently because obviously I wanted to move to Python 3. And it doesn't support Python libraries with C extensions, things like NumPy. So um, recently, a new project came out called Pi5, which I'm going to show off in a moment. And what Pi5 does is you can write Python code in any editor you like, and then it does a very similar thing to what processing's Python mode does, except it switches out Jython for something called JPipe. Uh, and then, of course, you get your graphics at the end. Um, what I actually do is I don't use VS Code as depicted there. 
I wrote a plugin for a little editor called Thunny. It's a beginner programming IDE for Python. And what that does is it kind of configures everything you need to configure in order to get up and running. So I'm creating like a processing-esque like experience, except using Pi 5. Now the great thing about JPipe, it provides full access to Java libraries from within CPython, supports Python 3, and now I can have things like NumPy and other libraries to see extensions. Another interesting thing that's developed re uh, recently is Web3, and of course the implications for art, specifically NFTs, whatever your opinion on them might be. Um, so this is a really nice tool to go, hey, um, students, if you do sort of creative code things, this is where you might land up putting them one day. So this is uh, a website, uh, FX Hash, and the idea behind FX Hash is you come up with some kind of a generative algorithm, and then it just changes out the random seed each time. Of course, uh, this example over here called Fidenza, there are 999 different permutations, uh, and naturally some things are gonna be more red than others, and that usually determines the price. Like, for example, maybe this one has green stripes in them, which is particularly rare, so that, that, that NFT would often be more expensive, but not always. Uh, they've also got something called FX Ape, which kind of is a take on the, probably the most well-known NFT, which is the Bathing Ape. Um, and the reason I'm showing you this is because if you look at the source code on FX Hash, um, you can actually see the code that's generating the art. And interestingly, many, many of the FX hash artworks are using p5.js, which is the um, uh, JavaScript version of processing. Uh, and if you take a look over here, you can see there's the p5.js library. And over here, like you saw a moment ago, there's a setup function and a draw function. Of course, there's some other ones over there. Key one is FX rand, uh, which is used to generate the random seed um, so that you get the unique artworks. And I've seen people take this into things like Blender, and this is where BPI is going to come in in order to make uh, 3D versions of these things. Um, the other thing that's kind of had a bit of a resurgence is plotter art. I spoke about plotter art a while ago. Um, basically, a lot of people would have to go and find vintage machines, but there are manufacturers now making uh, plotters, like this one from AxiDraw. These are a couple of works that I created, of course, generative artwork. So what I'll do is I'll write an algorithm, push out like 50 different versions of that art, and pick the one I like and plot that. Um, so there's the plotter in action, uh, there's another work. Of course, you can put any color pen you like in there. I'm messing around with uh, Moria patterns over here. Uh, you can do multiple runs with different colors. Uh, this is an example where I pushed an SVG, because it, it, it prints from SVG using Blender, but more on Blender in a moment. Uh, and then metallic inks, you don't have to use white uh, board. And kind of more recently, I, I, I like the challenge of trying to make algorithmic art look um, like it wasn't made by a computer, more organic, so like things that kind of look a little bit rough. Um, so that's just an example there. Uh, and this is another one I did, was kind of like a generative comic. So the destruction of different universes and every random seed you put in, you watch some other planet getting destroyed, um, just for fun. Um, of course, there are many other tools for doing uh, creative coding and generative art using Python, just a few over there. And of course, if you want to go outside of Python, there are plenty of other tools as well. So uh, resources for this presentation are listed on the website with the top description, but that is the URL. I'm very quickly gonna go over here and show you Pi 5 in action, and then Taylor's gonna show you some stuff with BPI, which is Blender. So what's happening over here? Um, I'm importing Pi 5, and then it's pretty much all the same code as processing, but what you can see is, obviously I've imported 5, not like imported into the, into the um, global namespace, so everything has a Pi 5 prefix. But what I've done is, with this plugin that I programmed for Thunny, this is Thunny, of course, um, I have got this imported mode option over here. So what I can do is I can make this more processing-esque by um, find and replace, uh, let's just say, whoops, let's try that again. Uh, let me try that again. Um, Okay, uh, not a problem. I knew it was a live demo and something might go wrong. So what I'm doing is gonna take this code over here and I'm going to run it in what's called imported mode for Pi5. And what that means is that I can take away all the Pi5 prefixes uh, and what it will do is it actually calls another script to run it um, so you don't have to have the import line at the top. Uh, so it's looking a lot more like processing. Um, if you wanna see, this is a, a very simple um, FX ape. <laughs> uh, I'm basically just 400 by 400 uh, getting a random seed, and then I'm not looping because I don't want an animation. And then over here, I have a stroke weight of three pixels. I'm filling the uh, ape in red, 
Uh, it's all state-based. So if you say full red, everything is red thereafter. Uh, I'm drawing a circle for the outer face, and I'm drawing a left eye and a right eye with a circle. Just to give you an example of what this looks like, here is the output. And uh, it should pop out there. Uh, you've got to use your imagination. I know it's not a great FX app, but it's just to give you some kind of uh, basics over there. And then what I can do is I can actually take this a step further, and I can put this into what's called static mode because I don't actually need a draw function because it's not an animation. And you can see what's happened over here. Exactly the same code, except I've removed the def setup and the def draw. Um, and then I can take this a step further, and I can start to say, OK, well, that's a really simple and boring FX ape. Uh, so here's a piece of code that I did, um, which does something a bit more elaborate. Uh, this one's called Digital Aquatics. Um, and as you can see over here, when I run this, it generates these aquatics using something called a super formula for the outer shape. And um, I'm just, I can generate as many of these as I like, right? Um, so that's something a bit more elaborate. Uh, the other thing that you can do here, of course, is you can plot, right? And in order to plot for the axi draw, you've got to make an SVG file. So what we have here is exactly the same code, except what I've done is I've got a begin record and then an SVG and file name, and I have an end record, and then any code that I place within that, which is exactly the code I had before, will be written to an SVG file. Um, the other thing I like to do is I like to use this tool called vPipe. If anyone's keen on plotting, really look into vPipe because it does a bunch of really cool things. And I'll give you some examples of why you might want to use vPipe. So here's my SVG version of the little FX app, what this is outputting over here. But if I run in some additional vPipe commands, I can start to do things like look at the pen up trajectory of my plotter. So where it's picking up the pen and putting it down somewhere else, what is that path? And those paths are indicated by these fine lines on the SVG. Now, this isn't optimal, so what I can do as well is I can run a sort on that as well using vPipe. And if you look at the sorted version, what we have is now this draws the outer face first, right? And then it moves across to the right eye and then to the left eye, whereas before it was doing the left eye, then the right eye. So it optimizes the trajectory. Of course, this is all determined by the sequence in which the SVG elements appear. And you can see these have kind of been shuffled up if you look through um, the browser inspector over there. Then um, you might want to say, OK, well, this is a plot. I don't actually want to see those overlapping lines. I'd like things to look like they were punched out of each other. So there's another thing called a cult. And what a cult is going to do is you can see where there's those two overlapping circles. It will get rid of the overlapping area. Um, which is pretty hard to do programmatically otherwise. And then over here, here once again, I wanted to show you, in addition to simple things, more elaborate things. Uh, this over here is um, some code where I used multiple pens. Um, if you look up at the top here, I've got my uh, noise seed and random seed um, commented out. So every single time I run this, what's going to happen is I'm going to get a different permutation in the browser over there. Um, I've taken a slightly different approach here. Instead of using begin, cord and, uh, begin record and end record, I've used a size function that includes some extra arguments. Basically, what this means is it doesn't pop up the processing window. It just writes straight to the SVG and exits. Cool. Um, next, I'll hand you over to Taylor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tristan. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, my background is visual effects. So um, I wanted to take a little bit of time to explain BPy to you, which is Blender's uh, um, uh, Python API. Um, uh, at using Maya in, in, in my background of visual effects, I you know, used Python extensively to make tools, to, to create cool things, to make over 20-something movies. Um, and I thought it would be quite useful to, to switch from this kind of um, 2D uh, sort of creative, uh, creative coding outlet to a 3D coding outlet and expand upon it. So um, some of the advantages of uh, BPY, or, uh, BPI sorry, is um, that it's open source, of course. Blender is open source. Um, the documentation is fairly clean. It's very user friendly. Um, and every, every, every action that you take uh, uh, in Blender is recorded and spat back out at you. And we'll talk about that in a minute with uh, interactive coding. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is um, of course, it's in integrated early into Blender as opposed to many other 3D softwares, be it Maya, Houdini, et cetera, which also have Python interfaces, but um, may not work as well because they generally uh, work through wrappers. Okay, so 
Um, so for every action, a reaction. This is something I just spoke with, with BPI, and that is um, every time you every every time you do anything, you, you you move the cursor and click on a button. Every time you um, you know create a primitive, and any, any time you do anything in Blender, um, it it is printed out as a Python statement. And in fact, you can actually toggle this. You can actually even toggle the Blender code on for buttons that you're not clicking on um, through uh, the preferences, which is very handy. Uh, if you don't want to just kind of surf through the documentation, not really knowing what you're looking for. Um, so um, the, all the examples, by the way, uh, are uh, B, uh, BPI examples, unless stated otherwise. Um, so yeah, you could, you could simply just kind of uh, do that, re do the action, copy and paste it, put it in the interactive interpreter, and see the result instantly. Um, so. Um, Data access. So I, I want to go through um, a few of the kind of few of the key concepts and modules. Being that I, I I'm going to assume that you you as Python developers know Python, I'm going to try to convince you to try Blender and, and talk more about Blender's uh, um, uh, you know uh, use of BPI and and how it functions really. Um, so uh, Python access accesses Blender. Uh, Blender's data through something called um, data blocks, and it works the same way in the in the animation system and the user face that, that, that as it does in code, which is very handy. It's almost like as if the way that you you work is the same way that you might code your first uh, BPI script, which which um, we'll see in a minute. So. Um, uh, yeah, so there are lots, lots of use cases. So a common, uh, I want to go through the common modules. Um, now, if you go to the BPI uh, documentation, you'll find that there are a lot of different modules, a lot of different um, uh, functions, classes, et cetera, that you, objects that you potentially think that you may want to use. But there are actually only um, two or three that you'll probably use in the beginning, um, especially in the early stages of exploring BPI. Um, and the first one is operators, so b, uh, bpy.ops. Um, and this co contains a lot of beginner-friendly ways of interacting with Blender. Again, in the same kind of manner I was speaking of earlier, where you're kind of copying your own workflow, really. Um, so this is, this is a way, this, this uh, module contains ways of creating, you know, a primitive cube or a sphere or a material or a shader or a texture and then putting it into the scene as well and also applying it and things like that. Um, it, it also has, uh, um, it also assumes, which is uh, uh, it initially might seem like a weakness, but it's actually quite a strength, that when you're using BPI, and uh, especially in ops, that you are working with a selected object. And, and, and this is for the viewport only, but um, uh, it comes in quite handy later. Um, now, think of this as kind of a C CPU intensive way of working down the road, but for, for the beginning, for your first scripts, I wouldn't worry about that too much. Just keep that in mind uh, later on. Um, so uh, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, BPI uh, operators is very, very good for interactive coding. Um, uh, Blender comes with an interactive interpreter, um, as well as uh, an another window for, for, for scripting, which is called the text editor, or text panel, depending. Um, and the interactive interpreter is, uh, uh, I think it's uh, for 3.0, it's probably like um, Python 3.9 or something like that. Um, and uh, you can just get feedback immediately. It's very, very useful, very useful for trying like one-liners and just seeing what will work. Um, again, beginner friendly, but heavy. Um, so the other, uh, other one I wanted to talk about was uh, outside operators was context. Um, so context is actually exactly as it sounds. It is the context of what's happening currently in the scene. Um, this is most often used. Uh, you'll see, in, in, in if you, you know, f find some uh, BPI scripts, you'll find context is used after some actions are performed. Because generally, the first thing that someone's going to want to do is access the selected object. Like I mentioned earlier, the first thing that when you, when you create something, um, it, uh, Blender uh, BPI specifically, nicely just selects the object for you, right? Makes it the active object. And with context, you can ac access those selected objects, you can access the scene data, you can access tool settings, you can access 
heaps of things. It's very, very useful. And in, in my opinion, this is the second most useful no, uh, module to know or um, of, of BPI, uh, starting out as a beginner, right? Um, okay, move on. Okay, so like I said earlier, I'm gonna keep, keep stating uh, this in different ways because I can't stress this enough. Um, I would, in the very, very, very beginning, I would code like you work, right? So um, I, I would, I would go, go through uh, in Blender, do some things, find what those code, uh, you know, what those outputs are and literally put, put them back in. Um, so what you're doing, what's, what's active, what's selected, et cetera, everything will be printed back out, uh, you know. Um, so uh, the, la the uh, third and final um, one I wanted to talk about was the bpy.data. Um, um, data is very interesting. It's, it's, it's probably what in your mind, if any of you are actually familiar with 3D programs, the, the one thing that I, I've been missing so far in this presentation is, well, how do you actually access the data or attribute to properties of these things that you want to manipulate, bpy data? Um, so unlike BPY context, which I forgot to mention, apologies, is just read only, BPY data is not. So BPY data, you can just kind of go to town. You can get um, any attribute, anything that you, 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 you can imagine is possible with BPY data. And um, you can actually do things like, say, in the shader editor, just make uh, manipulations, find out where these things are, and then literally con con uh, uh, copy them into your code. Um, uh, so the, the other thing about BPY data is you can make custom attributes. So if you want to be a little bit more advanced, then this is, is quite useful. Um, and for the final few slides, I just kind of want to go over how to make this easier on yourself if you're just starting out uh, with Blender. Um, I'm not going to talk about the Python side just uh, so much or, or those methods just because, again, assuming you're Python developers, uh, but that perhaps you have never used Blender. I would immediately toggle on the scripting work, uh, workspace, which is under the workspaces, top tabs. Um, the nice thing about this is it, it pro provides four windows that are very, very useful. Uh, one is the interactive console, which I spoke about earlier, which is kind of gives you feedback immediately. Um, the other is the text editor, where you can r write, read, create, and save Python scripts um, and load them as well. Uh, the third is the info panel, which gives some data that, that might be useful. Uh, but the fourth most useful uh, panel, which is different on PC than it is on Mac, by the way, uh, is the system console. With, with PC, you have to actually load it manually, like, like on screen. Uh, on the Mac, it's just best to launch Blender through the um, command line, um, and you will be able to get that data uh, that you would have in the Windows system console. Um, and with that, that is my time. Uh, just really quick toggling on tooltips, Python tooltips specifically, very, very useful uh, because you can just hover over anything in, in, in Blender and find the Python equivalent. Cool. And that's it. Thank you very much.